Thanks for me. Man, family, how good it is together with the saints. Amen? Yeah, it's good to be together this morning. This Sunday, we are, we're back in our We Are All Theologians series. Last week, if you were here with us or if you caught us online, you'll remember that we covered regeneration and we looked at Jesus' words to the Pharisee Nicodemus found in John chapter 3. And we examined what it means to be born again. And as I mentioned last week today, we're going to look at one of the incredible blessings that regeneration or spiritual birth brings, one of the blessings that we obtain from being born again. And we're going to look at the doctrine of adoption, adoption. What does it mean for those who have been born again, who have then responded to Jesus as their Lord and Savior through faith and repentance as we become adopted into God's family? We saw last year in our We Are All Theologians series that one of the other blessings that flows from being born again is that we become justified before a good God. We become justified. We obtain Jesus' righteousness as we stand before our holy God. We get to enjoy perfect legal standing before God through God's mercy and his grace, all because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. I am, it's just as if I'd never fallen short of the glory of God. Family, justification is an incredible blessing that flows from being born again and looking to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We become declared perfect and blameless in God's sight. Rooted Fellowship, what a privilege this is, amen? amen? We thank you and praise you, Lord, for this, the blessing of justification. But now this morning, we're gonna be looking at another blessing uh, that flows to us from this process, and that's the blessing of adoption, the blessing of adoption. And I love that these two weeks have come to us packaged that the way they, they have, right? Only in God's providence. Because you see, family, in the same way that we as families can grow our families through childbirth and adoption, so we as a localized church family are looking at these two theological topics together, spiritual birth and adoption. As Christians, we get to enjoy and embrace both of these theological doctrines, regeneration and adoption. And as Christians, we are called, or rather, we get the privilege of celebrating and reflecting both of these God-ordained doctrines to the world as well. Last week, we saw that through spiritual birth, we experience a new reality. Our eyes become opened to the things of God. We become spiritually alive to the things of God, much like a newborn child gains a new reality and becomes alive to the world they are born into. And this week, we're gonna see that through adoption, we experience a new identity as we become members of God's family. The same way the children who are adopted become members of families. John writes in John 1 verse 12, he says, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. Tim Keller said that we can see from this verse, John 1 verse 12, that our identity as Christian in God's family is received, not achieved. Amen. Our identity as Christians in God's family is received, not achieved. Amen. It's rooted in God's love for you and the fact that God, although he is your king, he is also your loving father. And there's an unconditionality in his regard for you, which is very different to any kind of of earthly identity. And today we're gonna to see that it is a blessing. It is a blessing to be adopted into God's family. And so with that, let's dive into the doctrine of adoption and all that it means to be adopted into God's family. We're gonna look at some of the privileges and joys that come with the blessing of being adopted into God's family. A lot of what we'll be covering today comes from uh, the work of a close friend of Rooted Fellowships, fellow Acts 29 pastor and author, Dr. Tony Merida. Uh, so he wrote a book with Rick Morton titled Orphanology, Awakening to Gospel-Centered Adoption. And in it, uh, they discuss much of what I'll cover today in much more detail. We thank God for their wisdom in this book, which also includes a systematic study on adoption 
grounded in John Piper's work on the subject. So it's safe to say we are in safe theological hands. And we pray that the God of the universe would use all of this great theology to bless us now in this time. Amen? In fact, let's, uh, let's pray before we take a deeper dive into the doctrine of adoption for today. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you adoring you, Lord God. You are the eternal, everlasting creator God that we have the privilege of getting to know, that we have the privilege of meditating on, Lord God, that we have the privilege of coming into relationship with. Lord God, how good you are. Thank you, Lord God, that we can gather here as your people in this time right now. Lord God, we pray for something extraordinary, something amazing to happen here today, Lord God. May we meet with you in a profound, profound way, Lord God. May you have your way in us. Holy Spirit, come and use this time to build your church, to strengthen us, Lord God, to draw us closer to you, closer to one another. May you open our eyes, Lord God, to the things you'd want us to see. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us new insights. May this time lead, lead us, Lord God, to fall at your feet and be so thankful for the gift of this adoption. And so come and have your way. Speak your truth now, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at a number of the Apostle Paul's words in his New Testament letters to the churches in Galatia, Rome, and Ephesus, all of which were heavily influenced by Roman culture. And so we're gonna, we're gonna see what Paul says about a God's adoption of us in these texts. And in essence, we'll be doing what is known as a systematic theological study on the doctrine of adoption. We're gonna be looking at a number of texts within the Bible that address the doctrine of adoption. And then as we come to, to, to dive deep into these texts, we're gonna bear that in mind that Paul, as he uses the word adoption, he uses the Greek word quethesia, quethesia. Okay, he uses the word quethesia for adoption. And this means to place as a son to place as a son. And so it essentially describes the fact that we are spiritual orphans, dead and alone in our sin before we come to know our Father God through the saving work of God the Son in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And then after we are born again and respond to Jesus in faith, we become God's children and we are placed as a son. Placed as a son. Family, this picture of adoption is helpful in understanding the gospel because it describes much of God's saving grace, past, present, and future. We're gonna see that God chose us in the past, he brings us to a place of faith in the present, and he promises to complete what he has started in us in the future. And so, firstly, what can we see about adoption? What do we see about the blessing of adoption? Well, God's adoption of us was intentional. It was not plan B. It was intentional, it was not plan B. Galatians 4, four to seven says this, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Regeneration, regeneration, right? We saw that last week. Paul continues, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. This adoption that the apostle Paul is writing about here is according to God's divine timetable. When the time came to completion, God then sends Jesus on his adoption rescue mission. We can see from this that adoption was always at the center of God's rescue plan. It was not his backup or his safety, plan B or C, it was his plan A. He made a way for us to be reconciled to God the Father, to become his children, plan A. Ephesians 1 verse four to five tells us more. Paul writes, for he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure 
of his will. To be predestined, what does that mean? It means to be marked out beforehand. And Paul reminds us here once again that salvation is God's work, initiated by him and not of any of our own doing. Brothers and sisters, God chose you. You are not an accident. No matter what the circumstances surrounding your life are, no matter what the circumstances surrounding your birth were, you are not an accident. David writes, Psalm 139, verse 16, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. You saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Family, someone in here needs to be reminded of this. Brother and sister, God chose you. He loves you. You are part of his family. You weren't plan B. He didn't get stuck with you. He didn't make a mistake. God's adoption of us was intentional. God's adoption of us is intentional. Second point, God's adoption of us was intentional and it was also costly, very costly. Let's go back to our text, Galatians 4. 4 verse 4 says this, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Roots of Fellowship, Jesus redeems us unto adoption into God's family. He leaves the comforts and security of heaven and comes to earth to a cradle in the dirt. He leaves, the perfect, he, he leaves perfect heaven to come to earth for us. He lives the perfect sinless life that we should have lived. And then he dies the excruciating death that we deserved. Paul writes one chapter prior to this text in Galatians that I've just read. In Galatians 3, verse 13, he he writes this. He writes that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How does Jesus do that? By becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Family, Jesus became cursed by his own father, by God, when he died on the cross for us. God forsook Jesus and exacted his justice upon him for all of our sins. And so Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. His work, not ours, removed the curse upon us because of our disobedience to God's perfect law, he steps in. And so therefore, God's adoption of us cost God the Father. It cost God him the life of his son. And it cost Jesus. He gave up his whole life in obedience to his father and he gave up every drop of blood for us. He endured the cross for our shame. God's adoption of us was intentional and it was extremely costly. What about, what else? What else can we say about adoption? It was intentional, it was costly. God's adoption saved us saves us from dire situations. Ephesians 2, verses one to five, Paul writes, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. Children under wrath. Family, Paul is telling us here in this verse that we were dead in our sins. That we were in essence following Satan because we were full of disobedience and depravity. And thus we were the objects of God's wrath. Verse four, but God. Someone say, but God. Everyone say, but God. 
but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, verse five, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. We are saved by grace. Because of God's mercy and grace, he saves us from dire situations and he brings us into a relationship with himself through the blood of Christ. Family, we were hopeless without God, hopeless, and rightfully under his judgment, but God. But God, in his mercy, makes a way for us to come into his family, to be welcomed because of Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus, we are delivered from slavery into sonship, slavery into sonship. And as such, our relationship with God changes. We have a new relationship. And so to recap, God's adoption of us is intentional. It's costly. It saves us. And we're now gonna see that it involves a relational change. We get a new relationship. As I mentioned earlier, and as we saw in the sermon series last year, through justification, Christians are declared righteous before God. We are righteous before God, what a privilege. Because Jesus stands in our place and pays the penalty for our sins. Through faith in Jesus, God now sees us guiltless, blameless before him. However, our family, our standing before God, our standing before God is not strictly a legal standing family. What begins with a legal standing through the blessing of justification then leads to a familial, relational standing through the blessing of adoption. That's why the theologian J.I. Packer says this. He says, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel, higher even than justification. Wayne Grudem, another theologian, puts it this way. He says, justification has to do with our standing before God's law, but adoption has to do with our relationship with God as our heavenly father. And in adoption, we are given many of the greatest blessings that we will know for eternity. When we begin to realize the excellence of these relational blessings, and when we appreciate that God had no obligation to give us any of them, then we will be able to explain with, to exclaim with the apostle John who wrote, 1 John 3 verse one, See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children, and we are. We are. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. In fact, some scholars say that it is this relational blessing that Jesus is speaking to when he says in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, therefore you should pray like this, our Father, how we came in this morning, our Father in heaven. Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You see, family, Jesus knows that he has come to pay the price for our sins and make us legally righteous before God. He knows what he has been sent to do and he knows that he will accomplish this. And yet, he still instructs his followers to pray this way. Our Father, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And he does this because he knows that through the doctrine of adoption that he brings about, we will have relational access to the Father. But because we are still waiting for Jesus' final return, where he will make all things perfect and new, we still sin, right? And this sin causes us relational distance between us and our heavenly Father. He's always merciful to forgive us because of Jesus, but that's why we pray and ask for forgiveness. Why? Because we have a relationship with him. Maybe this will drive home the point a little bit better. I am legally married to my wife. Legally, we are married. But if I do some stupid stuff, 
I still need to say, please forgive me because of our relational intimacy. And so through adoption, we gain a relationship with God the Father more than our legal standing with him. The fact that we have the privilege of experiencing a relationship with the God of the universe is an unthinkable, mysterious privilege of adoption. Amen? And so God's adoption of us is intentional. It's costly. It saves us. It involves a relational change with our creator. And it involves the spirit of sonship. The spirit of sonship. When Paul writes in Galatians 4, 6, and 7, and because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. He intentionally uses the term Abba, Father. Abba, Father. This was a diminutive Aramaic term of endearment that indicated a close intimacy between a child and their father. It would be like the term dada or papa today. In fact, it's the same term that Jesus uses whilst praying to God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he is crucified. We see this, Mark, Mark 14, verse 36. And Jesus said, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, what you will. And so, when we read these two verses together, Galatians and Mark, in light of this, we can see that through God's adoption of us, we receive the same spirit of sonship in our hearts that Jesus has. We do not become God the Son, but we have the same spirit of sonship in our hearts that Jesus has. And this privilege is probably best displayed in Paul's words to the Romans, found in Romans 8, verse 15 to 16. He says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And so because we are adopted, we are God's children. And because we are God's children, we have received and now have a spirit of sonship. The same spirit Jesus has within him in the garden before he was crucified. And so because we have that same spirit of sonship that Jesus has, well, then family, we don't need to fear anything. And this is speaking to me. We do not need to fear anything. We can trust and obey our heavenly father. Brother and sister, child of the most high living God, you have a spirit of sonship. And so that thing that was keeping you up all night last night, that thing that's filling you with anxiety even now as you sit here, that thing that's coming this week that you're fearing, or that thing that just never seems to arrive. You do not need to fear it. For you have a spirit of sonship by which you can cry out, Abba Father, Abba Father. You can cry out to your heavenly God, Abba Father. He hears you, He sees you, he's got you. And so may we trust and obey and wait contentedly on him through it all, amen? Amen. Now you may say, John, man, I hear you. That's very encouraging. But there's just something that's keeping me from embracing the spirit of sonship that I've received. We often say here at Rooted that we are in desperate need of a perfect savior and that that perfect savior is Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. And this morning, we're once again saying yes and amen to this. But this morning, I'd like to add that not only are we in desperate need of a perfect savior, but family, we are in desperate need of a perfect father. 
Because you see, many of us, when we spend time reflecting on God as our Father, it's difficult for us to relate to this because maybe we have strained relationships with our earthly fathers. They might be abuse, perfectionism, alcoholism, and some of us don't even have a relationship because we never have even met them. Fathers have been a target of the devil since the fall. And he's been intentional around that because fathers are a reflection of God the Father. But this morning, family, we are being reminded of the fact that no matter what our relationship with our earthly fathers looks like, we can be liberated from this. We can be set free from this because in God, we have the perfect dada, the perfect papa. You are a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Brother and sister, he hears you. He sees you, he's got you, he loves you unconditionally. He will never let you down. He calls you his child, his very own. He will never leave you or forsake you. God's adoption of us is intentional. It's costly. It saves us from dire circumstances. It blesses us with a relationship with God the Father. It blesses us with the spirit of sonship and it completely transforms us. Next point, it completely transforms us. From it, family, remember once we've been born again and put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are justified before God and we experience the blessing of being adopted into God's family. And, th- and when this happens, we are completely transformed. Everything begins to change. God's Holy Spirit begins to work in and through us. He begins to sanctify us or make us more and more like Jesus. Paul says this one verse back from the text that I just read, Romans 8 verse 14, he says, for all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. And Paul also says, Ephesians 5, verse 1, that therefore, therefore we should be imitators of God as dearly loved children. And finally, Jesus even says, Matthew 5, verse 16, that his followers should in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. When we are adopted into God's family, we as children of God and as followers of Jesus receive his Holy Spirit that begins to work in and through us to become more and more Christ-like. And it causes us to shine our light into the world and to share our hope that is found only in Jesus with this world. We are completely transformed. And although the working out of this transformation can can and it does take time, a process that as Christians we refer to as sanctification, even though this working out of, our, of this transformation does take time, we as transformed people with our new identity, we begin to experience a decreasing thirst for the things of this world, yeah. along with an increased hunger for the things of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Don't you love it when science catches up with God? I love it when science catches up with theology. This transformation can very much be seen in the social science studies of habits. James Clear, in his New York Times bestselling Atomic Habits book says that true behavior change is identity change. And the reason you stick with that change is because it becomes part of your identity. He goes on to say that your behaviors are a reflection of your identity. Your behaviors are a reflection of your identity. And so brother and sister, the next time that you're tempted by the things of this world, why not remind yourself of who, or rather whose you are? You are a beloved child of the Most High God. And family, here's another reason to be rooted in community. 
Because when we, are, when we are in regular community, we remind one another of whose we are. We sing to one another of whose we are. And so the next time you are drawn to the things of this world, remember you have been completely transformed and pray that God's Holy Spirit would equip you to do what Jesus would do in that situation. God's adoption of us is intentional. It's costly. It saves us. It involves a relational change. It involves the spirit of sonship. And it gives us the right, the right to be called heirs of the Father and co-heirs with Christ. We become heirs of the Father and co-heirs with Christ. Now, you'll recall earlier that I mentioned that the three churches that our text today come from, well, they were heavily influenced by Roman culture and law. And in this ancient Roman Greco world, it was sons, sons who enjoyed the full inheritance rights of their families' estates. Another thing to note is that under Roman law, at the time of Paul's writings, an adopted son was guaranteed all hereditary legal rights to his father's property and estate upon his father's death, even where that child was formerly a slave. In fact, many of the Roman emperors had adopted sons out of slavery, and these adopted sons then enjoyed full rights as heirs. I want you to park that, but to keep it in the back of your mind. Sons both biological and adopted, enjoyed the full inheritance rights of their family's estates. Now, another thing to note from Paul's letters to the Ephesians, Galatians, and Romans is that Paul intentionally uses the Greek word huioi, huioi. Okay, he uses the Greek word huioi, meaning sons. And he uses sons, huioi, at certain times, and then at other times, he makes use of the word technon, Technon, which means children. So sometimes he uses sons, huioi, other times children, technon. And so if Paul uses the word technon for children in certain places, why didn't he just always use that word all the time? Why not always use the word technon and be inclusive throughout? Is he intentionally not addressing women or daughters of God? Not at all. It's not what's happening here. But he is certainly intentionally doing something. And he's using the word sons, huioi, to convey something. And I think some of y'all have already seen where we're going with this. You see, family, within this ancient Roman Greco world that Paul is speaking into, he is fully aware that his readers know that it was sons, many of whom were adopted, sons who enjoyed the full inheritance rights of their families' estates. And so what Paul is doing here is that he is intentionally seeking to say to all of Jesus' followers, both men and women, indeed all of those that have been adopted into God's family, he's saying to us that we get to enjoy the privilege of inheritance that was only afforded to sons to inherit. Paul specifically uses the word sons as a reminder that the inheritance privilege has come to all men and women led by the Spirit of God. And we all now enjoy the status as sons and heirs of God. That's why Paul says, Romans 8 verse 17, and if we are children, then we are also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And in Galatians 4 verse 7, he says, and if a son then God has made you an heir. When someone passes away, they leave, or to use the the proper legal term, they bequeath their remaining assets and property in the form of bequests to their respective heirs. Family, I've got good news. As co-heirs with Christ, we have been bequeathed something huge, something that we cannot even fathom. Because you see, family, the value of an inheritance is dependent on the worth of the one bequeathing it. Think about that. The value of an inheritance is dependent on the worth of the one bequeathing it. The eternal, everlasting, creator God of the universe is the one who promises you and me an inheritance. Not only that, he is that inheritance. Because of all the things that God could give us, his children and his heirs, the most precious and satisfying gift that he could ever give us is himself. Amen? 
Psalm, 20, Psalm 73, verse 25. 73, verse 25, the psalmist writes, who do I have in heaven but you? I, I desire nothing on earth but you. Yes. Revelation, we are told that God's people will dwell with him forever. They will dwell with him forever and that there is nothing more satisfying than this. Revelation 21, verse three says, then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And so brothers and sisters in the Lord, or should I say fellow sons of God, co-heirs with Christ, let us be encouraged. Our inheritance awaits us. A time is coming when we will be apart from the presence of sin, suffering, and death, and we will be in our Father's presence forever. God's adoption of us is intentional. It's costly. It saves us. It involves a relational change. It involves the spirit of sonship, and it bestows upon us an inheritance. It's clear that as a result of these privileges, we gain a new identity. We are granted a new identity. We are now saved. We become children of the Most High God. We enjoy a relationship with Abba Father. We have His Spirit dwelling within us, and we are co-heirs with Christ. Through adoption, we now form part of God's family. Brothers and sisters, yes, we may have our earthly families, but the Bible often speaks of the church as the family of God, our blood-bought family. We saw that this morning, right, as we welcomed new members into the family. In fact, in Mark's gospel, Mark 3, verses 31 to 35, Jesus' earthly mother and brothers, they come to Jesus whilst he's teaching. And it's so crowded in there that they can't even get to speak to Jesus. And so they call to him from outside, And the crowd surrounding Jesus, well, they see this, and they say to Jesus, "Uh, your mother and your brothers are outside. Mark 3, verse 33. Jesus replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Christian, brother and sister here this morning, here are your brothers and your sisters and your mother. What a joy this is, amen? Amen. And so as we reflect on these beautiful truths on the doctrine of adoption, what is our response? What is our response? Gospel demands a response. We are compelled to respond. Well, firstly, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but the Spirit of God has awakened you to His truth this morning, and we pray that that's happened, then, brother and sister, I'm imploring you. I'm imploring you to respond in faith and to look to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Put your faith and trust in Him, and as you do that, you will be saved. You will begin a relationship with your Abba Father, your Creator, in the power of the Holy Spirit, as you enjoy a new status and identity as a co-heir with Christ. And if that's you this morning, why don't you come up here after the gathering and tell someone. We'd love to pray with you, to come alongside you, and to welcome you into the family of God. And then, to the fellow brothers and sisters here at Root to Fellowship, my brothers and sisters, we are part of God's family because we've been adopted into God's family, amen? Amen. And so the world needs to see us opening up our homes to one another and relating to one another as brothers and sisters, not just in our earthly families, but also within our church family. Eat and run is a great opportunity to do that. Are we visiting with one another? Are we there for one another? We need to be reminding ourselves and one another of who and whose we are as we seek to be salt and light in this world. 
Jesus' hands and feet to a world in desperate need of a savior. We need to be cultivating our relationship with our Abba Father through daily prayer, Bible reading, weekly gathering with the saints on Sundays, at family group, and while serving. We need to leave our comforts and be on mission as we seek to grow the family of God. And we need to do all of this in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need to reflect the Father heart of God to this world. A, good, a world in desperate need of a Savior and in desperate need of a perfect Father. God the Father has adopted us into His family through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen this morning that this doctrine of adoption is such a beautiful picture of the gospel, the saving work of God. Amen? Amen. In fact, family, that, this is why earthly adoption has always been close to the people of God. It's always been something that Christians have actively participated in and supported for over 2,000 years. Now, am I saying that every Christian should therefore adopt? Well, no, not necessarily. In the same way that marriage is a picture of the gospel and not every Christian is married, adoption is something that we as Christians should pray about and ask God for wisdom and discernment around. Regardless of what you believe God is calling you to do in response to the beautiful doctrine of adoption, this is something that all Christians should come around and support. Just as we do with the gift of marriage and biological children and with the gift of singleness. We should come around and support. As you reflect on your own response to what God's Spirit is stirring in your heart this morning, I wanted to end the message today by sharing uh, that my wife, Kirsty, and I have chosen to grow our family through adoption. Praise God. And uh, this has been something that we've been considering and praying about for a number of years as we sought God's will for our family. And that time has now come to completion. Uh, we're, we're in the process of being matched with a child, and sometime in the not-so-distant future, our child will come home. Yeah. And I want you to see if this sounds familiar. We've been really intentional around this. This is the way we are intentionally and joyfully choosing to grow our family. It has involved lots of planning, and it has been a thorough and robust process, which we're really grateful for. Our child will form part of our family, and they will bear our family name. They will be our heir. They will call us mom and dad. And they will form part of the church family here at Rooted Fellowship. Amen? Amen. And so please, we ask that you be praying for us. Uh, be praying for all of the families in our church and across the world who adopt. Let's come around them and support them because family adoption is a beautiful picture of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and respond in prayer. Good, gracious God, our perfect Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning because of what you have done, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we, as your children, can come to you and call you Abba Father, that we can cry out Abba Father because of what you have done, God the Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for paying for us to know you, Lord God. Thank you that you made a way, that you were intentional, Lord God, that when the time came to completion, you sent your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you did not hold back a single drop of blood, that you paid for us, Lord God. You drew us to you, Lord God, with the flesh on your back, with the blood in your body, Lord Jesus. That, Father God, you paid for us with the life of your Son. Thank you, Lord God, that you saved us. We cannot even imagine what you saved us from. But your word tells us, Lord God, that we were dead, and now we are alive. We were blind, but now we see. We thank you, Lord God, that we 
are now your sons. Lord God, that we have a spirit of sonship, that we can cry out to you, Abba Father, that we do not need to fear the things of this world, that we are no longer slaves to fear. We thank you, Lord God, that you have completely transformed us, that we are a new creation, that we are yours. We thank you, Lord God, that we are your heirs, that we will spend eternity with you, that we have an inheritance, Lord God, with you forever and ever and ever that we will have you, Lord God. And Lord God, we thank you for the blessing it is to have a local family, a church family, to be part of the family of God, brothers and sisters who are there for us to remind us whose we are. What a privilege it is to be part of your church, Lord God. And so come now, Holy Spirit, may we respond. I pray for those in here that are hearing your gospel message for the first time. Would they look to you, Lord Jesus? Would you save them? And I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would move in and through us, that you would lead us to become more and more like you in whichever way you are calling us to be more and more like you. We thank you that we are adopted into your family. We praise you and love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.